A good space game is what? I asked the patrons, I asked the people on Reddit, I asked the people on Discord to give me the ideas. What I want to do with these podcasts is to not put specific uh, levels on anything, not to control the discussion, because one of the things that happens with that is it's very easy to sort of get contained in the same answers for everything, answers that you may have heard in the podcast. So what makes a good blank or a series of podcasts where patrons, people on Reddit, people on Twitter and Discord get to answer whatever question I pose to them. And this time it is what makes a good space game with whatever they want. And we talk about it contained within that particular element. So whatever answer they give is how we're going to go. And if I get 50 different answers, we're going to jump to all 50 and we're going to explain it a bit. It's just a fun thought process. One of the ones I already read was from AV on Patreon, and, and they said a good space game should make you feel the unending magnitude of space, whether that is through awe and wonder, terror, or sheer excitement of the possibilities that the endless nothingness contains. Now, you can't tell me that's not probably going to be one of the best answers because that answer is phenomenal. What's awesome about these kind of podcasts and what's awesome about these kind of sentences is the moment you read it, your brain's already thinking of those games, games like Elite, which is absolutely about magnitude of space. But when you look at Elite and when you look at those games that do handle space in that magnificent large way and you look at the different viewpoints that you can take it in, for example, third person, first person, what have you, what makes a good game, what makes you feel that unending magnitude of space. And I would say certainly how they handle distance and how it's reflected back to the gamer. And there's various different games that handle the distances differently. For example, Freelancer handled the distances based on gates. So you basically, you basically warped between systems and those systems were actually quite large in and of themselves. Third person and first person was allowed as well as fighter dog kind of, uh, you know, dog fighting ships as well as larger ships. But then we have Free Space 1 and 2. We have Star Lancer for the Dreamcast and PC at the time and how they handled space. They handled space uh, not necessarily well. What they did was they did cutscenes for Star Lancer. So the cutscene gave you the feeling of something happening while you were taking a trip or while you were traveling. You can actually do that quite well. You don't always have to have the player, the character, the person who is experiencing it go through and fly consistently or endlessly. For example, back to Freelancer, one of the things I noticed about Freelancer and how it handled distance was they ended up making sure that there were some locations that just had nothing. Now, this has popped up with Todd Howard talking about uh, Starfield multiple times and the discussion around Starfield having places where nothing is there. And that is many times just like the pause in music at a certain point or the change in tempo that we see. Those kind of situations, I think, are actually one of the best ways that you can deliver the feeling of distance in a game is to have that space where nothing's occurring and where you're flying, where your brain's like, there's got to be something there. Oh, there's nothing there. It's got to be something there. Oh, there's nothing there. And maybe you take a trip into one of these far off systems. I believe if I remember right, the Hawaii systems were the ones in Freelancer and the Alaska systems were the ones that had very little, but they occasionally out in the middle of nowhere had a wreck or a derelict, and it would make you in your brain go, whoa, what happened way out here? Was this person a traveler just like me? Did they push it? But maybe they had a little less gas than me. You know, they pushed it and they're out here and I'm the last person to see this dying memory out in space. Even though those places in Freelancer, they were sizable. For the time, they were sizable. They weren't endless like we see in some games using procedural generation, but that handled it quite well. And then you look at Elite and you look how it's handled it with its multiple star systems and the ability for them to just basically say, go forth and do whatever. One of the things that we saw with Elite and I think why it succeeded at first and while it's certainly having some teething issues right now, I guess you wouldn't call them teething issues. You call them some maturity issues. It's hitting its teens and it's a little angsty. And one of the reasons why that is, is when that game first launched, it was all about space and you would go to a space station. Great, but you weren't landing on the ground. You weren't even able to land on planets with your little rovers. It was all about space, the depth of space, and it was about the trip and the trip took a great deal of mental resources to prepare for. And that's one way to make a game feel large. If you want to give somebody that unending magnitude of space, if you want them to feel wonder and terror, make them realize that the steps that they're taking to do the trips between the two places is 
terrifying. It can be scary. And it requires the player to actually do something correct, which is the opposite in many ways of what you saw in a freelancer, which is where you could do the inner jumps quite easily. But then when you went to the farther areas, those areas were, could be quite dangerous for your spaceship if you didn't have the right shields, both handling it slightly differently. Now, I don't want to talk about Star Citizen because that's not out yet. Star Citizen's doing it a certain way. You certainly have No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky, I think, the procedurally uh, generated content that they did is why it had such a hard time at the starting. It has come into its own, but it's taken many years. And for 90% of companies, we wouldn't see those companies have continued with all the problems. Luckily, what we get with that game is a continuation and finally this amazing game, but certainly a game that I think a lot of people have brought up that there aren't that many planets with nothing. And that's because the game always outfits you with some way for you to glean a resource from a planet, even at its most basic. There are certainly places you can't go due to dangers. But what I mean is. There isn't a lot of empty space in that game. When you really think about it, it looks empty, but the game has a tendency to throw a lot of stuff at you, whether it be asteroid fields, what have you. And when you look at real space and how, for example, how distant our asteroid field is, that fits more with Elite than it does No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky really is the colorful comic version of space. Certainly nothing wrong with it, but I can't say that it gives me a feel of terror Sheer excitement, maybe endless nothingness for sure. It doesn't, but magnitude of space and wonder, I think it hits that and I think it hits awe. So just by looking at those couple games, you already see this massive split in how each one handles it, where I think No Man's Sky is pretty much on the middle where freelancers at one space, then maybe you get elite at the other. You get No Man's Sky, which is right in the middle, and it's sort of got its mixture of all of them. And of course, the ability to land on planets, which and walk around, which Freelancer had the ability to land on planets, but you couldn't really walk around other than the cutscenes of you going to different hubs. So I thank you for your answer. It's fantastic. That is one of those answers that uh, caused me to think right away. Uh, Luis answered as well. If I'm mispronouncing your name, I apologize. We have different uh, names that are spelled that way, and I just want to make sure you can certainly correct me in the patrons. He says to me, the idea of having the chance of travel anywhere like Elite. I love the combination of massiveness and a killer ambient soundtrack. So... I would agree about the soundtrack. I absolutely would agree. I don't know if that's really required in space games. I'm not saying it's not required and it can help you. I guess what I'll say is that I don't put it in the same, really in the same discussion just because it can also have no soundtrack and really feel like space. For example, something along the lines of, um, you know, the deep space missions that might have occurred at times in Battlestar Galactica when that percussive music wasn't playing but i get the idea of that chance of traveling uh anywhere like elite i think what elite ex succeeded on originally was traveling to most places there were a lot of places that were dangerous but also that ability for you to make a mistake you could overshoot your planet you'd end up at a planet with uh you know not enough places to get gas you could call for help so there was all of these excellent aspects to Elite in particular that it handled well. And Elite is building, of course, upon the original Elite, uh, which was geez, 1980s. I think it was like 87. I could be wrong on the date for that, but that game is old as hell. It's old, just old as ice, man. But a phenomenal game and definitely one that back then made you feel like we were in space. And now we're looking at the graphics sort of taking that uptick to where what you see is sort of what you get. Another thing that has been interesting to hear a lot of developers say that you can pretty much make your game graphically display what you want. It won't be perfect, but you can sort of get an idea and say, I want the game to show this. And resources, of course, being what they are, you can probably show that, which I think is uh, we're at a pretty incredible time because I play a lot of other space games. I play Space Traders uh, that's on the Android and a couple others, but it, it's a different style of game to me. And it certainly is a, a time frame I think we're looking at where a lot of times the graphics are one of the ways for you to get such a feeling because whether it's the scale, like No Man's Sky, where you fly around the entire planet to find a place to land, even though those planets are scaled down, or it's Elite where you can overshoot, um, or even older, like I said, Free Space or something like that, where you know you're it's sort of right in the middle. 
These are great. I love these ideas, and I think that this really helps uh, draw the discussion down different lines, different parallels that maybe we weren't necessarily thinking of. When I when I do a lot of these podcasts, it's very easy to contain yourself into that one discussion, and so I'm really happy that a lot of you guys jumped in to answer this. When it comes to Captain Brain Laps, who's in our Discord, he says, I think having your ship feel truly distinct and like a second home is pretty important. I'm thinking of Mass Effect and having the Normie always there that you can chill at. You know... I'm going to agree and I'm not going to disagree at all. I'm going to agree. I think that that is fantastic. I think that the Normandy was so shallow, though, that quite quickly I became very disenchanted with the Normandy. So let me explain myself here real quick. There were all these hubs that you could go to in Mass Effect. And so I felt that your ship would be a hub. So at minimum, maybe especially for the 360, which I don't know if you guys remember, the 360 let you listen to your own audio while you were playing a game. You could actually turn on an MP3 player. The lack of, let's say, an MP3 player inside of the captain's quarters or the lack of really being able to do much other than feed the fish really let me down in Mass Effect. Strangely enough, I think I just went in there thinking, okay, it's going to be this, it's going to be that, and it let me down. But I think your idea, and of course, you, you're right because... Your answer is right for whoever you are. I think Mass Effect is a, a good example. You know, the Normandy is a ship people talk about and they know. And once you get to that point, that's what matters is that feeling of ownership, I think, is really what you meant, which that feeling of ownership is also cool because it can separate you from the ship, but also contain you on the ship. So let me give you an example. When you have a feeling of ownership in Freelancer, you get out of the ship and you walk around the HUDs, but your ship is your ship and you can see it, by the way. They put your ship in the background and on the side. So there's always this tangible feeling of getting it. And when you switch out ships, they show them switching out, right? And then you get games like No Man's Sky, where you land on your space station and you have this feeling of ownership because there's your ship and you can come out from trading and leap down, use your jetpack, and suddenly there's your cool decked out ship. Now, one of the things I was a little unhappy about with No Man's Sky, and I'd like to see him do more, is more customization visually on your ship because you really don't have any. Uh, you get your randoms, but it's, it's always odd, I think, to me that there's so much stuff you can do in that game. And yet you really can't say, hey, man, you know, I'm going to I'm going to pimp my ride. But I do agree. I think that feeling truly distinct, and this is something we see in TV shows. For example, the Enterprise, regardless of the crew, the Enterprise is always known of. The Enterprise, whether it be Scott Bakula as Captain Archer in the original Enterprise, whether it be Kirk in the original, original series, or whether it be Picard or anybody, whenever there's a captain of the Enterprise, you do think of it as your home. And the Enterprise, one of the reasons why the Enterprise worked is because even if you didn't know this consciously, you knew it subconsciously. And that's that for the Enterprise in the next generation, they had people on it. They had like basically families. It was an exploration vessel. But what happened with Archer and his team and the Enterprise generally, and then what happened in the Enterprise with uh, Captain Kirk was that the people, the family of the crew, that was their family, and everybody owned the Enterprise. Everybody had their section of the Enterprise, and you would be stunned to realize just how useful that is. For you, the jack-of-all-trades is gone in those. Um, there were still jack-of-all-trades, but what I mean is the locations. When you, engineering was Scotty, you just, that was his home. So there are many homes. It was that Kirk owned the Enterprise technically, but at each one of these locations, there was this person that sort of owned their spot. And what's the most interesting to me is when you really look at the bridge, you would think Kirk, right? Which I agree. For the most part, you do see that. But you also see, you know, Ohura doing quite well there and really having her spot there. And it was her location. I mean, even look at the way she talks. By the way, go back and look at the old episodes and you'll see her holding on to the entire console in front of her many times while talking to alien races. And there was an idea, her idea was that this is my spot. I like, it wasn't just about her wanting to look action packed. It was like actually her owning that location. And I think that that's cool. So yeah, ownership's a big deal. Uh, Astro says scale, everything about space is huge. So the game needs to convey that either zoom in way out or, or way in and home world commander or free space. Yeah. I mean, I think you can have space where it's just your solar system and isn't big, 
But for you personally, it sounds like it's scale. And I would agree that, uh, you know, that works for me for the most part, though I certainly do love a space game that's just right above Earth's atmosphere. It all depends. Scale is important. You got Wing Commander in there you mentioned. Of course, free space, flying along those capital ships. Yeah, sense of scale. Let's remove space for a second. You can do sense of scale just on Earth or at the very minimum do sense of scale with the ships, as you mentioned. Yeah. So if you have a good idea of your sense of scale with the ships, if you understand the sense of scale so that a, a person is this size, the fighter, if that's what they have in this world, the, the fighter spaceship is this size, the capital ship is this size, the Enterprise is this size. Uh, I said Enterprise, but you guys get my drift. Then it works very well for scale and you can sort of get an idea. And that first time you see three or four ships battling your brain can say, okay, I know there's 6,000 people in the middle of battle because it's like 222 or what, you know, 2000, 2000, 2000, or whatever. And your brain can figure it out. And you may not even know you're figuring that out, but over a period of time, you will. Now, here's something quite interesting. I don't know if people picked up on this. This is actually a problem Battlestar Galactica's new series had. So, Battlestar Galactica's new series had a tendency to vacillate between um, the actual location itself the 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 Battlestar Galactica as well as you had the one season that was entirely on the planet then a lot of times you would jump to other uh, other ships this is something that the original game had a little bit less of an issue with because uh, I think that the original show actually did a good job jumping into that right away but the new show had an issue with scale a lot of times I remember distinctly at times going like well how many people they tell you how many people were there and they it almost felt like they had to, because if they didn't, you could be quite confused seeing these ships. For example, if you look at the Battlestar Galactica and they tell you how many people are on it, it's quite easy to be confused how many people are on that because you see their launch bays and your brain puts together how many, you know, how, let's say how many ships can be in there, how wide is the ship, how wide is the ship versus the bay. Well, they can't fit that many people in there. But then, of course, you forget that if you look simply at our aircraft carriers, you know, they can have multiple, multiple, multiple thousands on a single aircraft carrier, even though when you see a couple airplanes take off, you're like, man, their takeoff area isn't really necessarily much wider than the airplane. But that's good planning, uh, incredibly efficient usage of the storage and the decks. And of course, just being a TV show, right? Not having to be entirely correct. Here we go with Vig Villain. His answer is, uh, when I think about what I want out of a space game, I think I'm expecting three core pillars, a large scope, vast distances, varied locales, uh, diverse concepts and exotic species Two exploration gameplay. I want to control where and I want to be surprised when I get there. Three problem solving decision making. I want space travel to feel challenging. That's interesting because I know a lot of people who would want exactly the opposite. So this is good. It shows that all these games that we're getting and we are getting so many different games in this genre that there's so much to offer every single person. So, for example, you want exploration and gameplay. Some people just want, you know, dogfighting, right? You want these, uh, this large scope, vast distances, varied locales, diverse concepts, exotic species. And there's many a space game with no real aliens at all. For example, Firefly, one of the most popular shows in the world, separated its distances quite differently than most others, where you could be confused on exactly what was going on. You could look at this and go, okay, I don't get it. Are they jumping space station? Or, or sorry, are they jumping entire solar systems? What exactly is going on? Why does this big ship look like a cathedral? Which is something that actually happened in one of the later episodes. Uh, it reminds me a lot of Warhammer 40,000. But they handled their space and depth quite differently than Battlestar Galactica did differently than Enterprise. And then those, when they turn into games, they're handled differently as well. But uh, yeah, it's awesome to hear you guys talk about this. Also, problem solving decision making. That's one thing that I think is quite interesting, depending on if you're the captain or of a big ship, captain of a small ship, uh, one person on a ship, or depending on if you even can walk around in the ship, because problem solving decision making many times can lead towards decision making where the player just simply wants to decide resources to spend, like put shields here put engines here where somebody else thinks of decision making as being I want to get out of my seat and I want to go downstairs and decide the exact kind of tofu that we have. So there's two levels to that for sure. And I'm trying to think, I would say my favorite, I really don't have too many, uh, too many requirements when it comes to space games. I will say that what I've always wanted from a space game, and by the way, this would be unfun. This would be damn near unplayable. 
and we've seen a couple games on Steam try this, but I really want a game to come out at some point in the future where you do get to do all of that kind of, where it's basically the Sims in space, where you can do that. You can go down, you can decide this and that. You can jump into the lowest of the low kind of decisions that go on with the spaceship and then all the way to the highest of the highs. We used to talk about this before GTA 6 was announced, before we really knew what that was going to be. And I was like, man, you know, Rockstar nails it. They've got themselves all of these different games and they had just released their, you know, I mean, one of the greatest games of all time in Red Dead. And I was thinking to myself, man, it would be amazing if they did like a Battlestar Galactica space game kind of thing where you were on a spaceship or let's say you were just a private detective like L.A. Noir, but you were in a space station. And maybe they just will never do that. Maybe they fear that it will be too much or that it wouldn't work. But I would love that kind of thing where you have all of their interactions, but in another world, something like what we get with Red Dead. And we've seen some Steam games do it, but they've really, there's just too much required, obviously. I'm not an idiot, but I still do think it would be very cool to have that sense of no matter where you go in the game, there's something there. We see that a lot of times where they'll be like, oh, you can do this and do that. And then you go down into the engineering and there's like one little box there that has you press up or down on what you want to do. Do you want to go fast or do you want to go slow? And it's like, dude, I'm even close to talking about that. Now we are getting the technical know-how and wizardry, for example, No Man's Sky allowing you to have freighters with your ships on the freighters. We're getting there. We're getting there. It's not going to be too long to where scale and that kind of stuff is getting to this point where we're just blown away by the sense of scale and exploration is not only going to be in the macro, but the micro. The sense of decision making, though, I think is certainly really what probably ends up parsing out the entire game. If your sense of decision making is incredibly vast and powerful, then maybe you won't be able to make those smaller decisions. And I don't know if I've seen a game that really allows for any allows for any change to that. It, it, many games don't allow for any real decision or, or problem solving at all. For example, No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky problem solving would technically be in resource management versus, let's say, actual true problem solving. And we can talk about that, Vig, because you were you were saying that, you know, decision making, I need space travel to feel challenging and risky. To many people, not having enough uh, resources at a particular time that they need them is challenging and risky, where to other people, it would be alien races. To other people, it would be problems with their spaceship. What's fun about that is if you were to take a graph or you were just to take, actually, you wouldn't even need a graph, a piece of paper, put three points down, draw a triangle between those three points and try to ask everybody where they want to intersect. I bet you you would have an incredibly difficult time getting all those people who want those different things to intersect into a game that is playable. Because I think that at some point you start, it, it becomes, it sways one way and then sways the other, where decision making goes one way or where the problem solving is incredibly rote to one person where it's the exact problem solving they want. And most games don't put in automation so that they can take care of either kind of problem solving. They usually have an automation to take care of one kind. So for example, you may have to work a bunch to get your engine up to snuff when you start out in a game, but then after a while you're able to automate it and you're done. And what that automation does is it removes you from that gameplay element later on, which is something I've talked about before, which actually bothers me a little bit because it's exactly the opposite for the most part of the way a lot of people live their lives. To give you an example, a NASCAR engineer slash mechanic just because everything's automated in their test bed doesn't mean that they're not spending hours upon hours upon hours on their back under a vehicle working on stuff and what happens with games we have a tendency to lose that when we get to a point in games where we say okay we want automation to take care of this one particular element or we have enough skill in this thing Games usually remove the skill. There is usually either an on or an off or a segmented one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten levels of of your ability to sort of train in this and look at different things. But at some point it either at some point it usually goes away. It usually does, especially in some of these larger games. Um, Ronan PT says the sense of vastness of space, the sense of freedom that you can go anywhere you want is the more important thing as far as I'm concerned. And of course, gameplay when it comes to ship controls. It's interesting that so many people have responded in a way that I would say is really 
conducive to space as the game and not a game based in space. And there's a reason why, because space as a word is not only the location we think of, but also the distance itself. There is space. So you think of it in two ways. And the way I wrote this request to get information was pretty, it wasn't specific, but it was pretty much aligned so that I wasn't going to get a lot of people talking about space invaders if you get my drift. And so most people responded in that way, which I think is pretty cool and responded in the idea of vastness of space, sense of freedom, sense of movement, six degrees or 20 degrees of Kevin Bacon depends on how, how much uh, free way, free, like feeling you want in your spaceship. But for me, I like all of this kind of stuff. Kel says really depends on the purpose of the game. Okay. So he's understanding exactly that there is that other, not that you guys didn't, but I'm saying he's the first one to mention it. Uh, BSG, which is Battlestar Galactica, Deadlock is a pretty decent space game. Not a lot of exploration or mystery there, but I friggin' loved it. Not a lot of exploration involved in X-Wing or squadrons either. Lots of pretty explosions, though. So he's gone the opposite way, which is towards the more we are in space, and that's pretty much it versus space as a thing. It's just we are in space. So Battlestar Galactica really is that. It's a strategy game and a very good one at that. And it's got incredible DLC, but it's more about just uh, captaining the Battlestar Galactica during combat. And its cutscenes are where the travel is and its cutscenes are where the exploration is. And Squadrons is the same way. Of course, those being more Call of Duty style games. Amud says a good space game for me would be a co-op open world game with complex alien races that you would be able to interact with, make enemies with, and also build bases and invade other alien races. Yeah, I think we're waiting a long time for that. I think you're going to see some stuff with AI, and certainly No Man's Sky is close in some elements of that. But when you look at these games, guys, and you look at diverse alien races, they're not going to get too diverse because if they go too diverse, you're going to get a Mass Effect issue. And I don't know if you guys know this story. But in Mass Effect, of course, you got your marshmallow dudes and the Hanar. You know, these are these giant jellyfish slash marshmallow dudes, some of my favorite uh, characters in the world. But they didn't know how to animate them. They, there was literally no way to animate them correctly, and they couldn't even figure out how to put them in spaceships. They were like, well, what if we want to see this character doing something, even just moving around or talking to other characters? What exactly are we going to do? And there was all kinds of difficulties. And one of the major reasons why is because we think of diverse alien races for the most part there's a divergent for diverse there's diverse within the species of humanity and what we expect most biological creatures to look like because we've seen shows with them looking like that which is bipedal you know they may have four arms right but there's still there's a segment of them that we look at and go i gotcha i know where you're coming from and then you have characters like i believe it was the henar who have no real translation to anything that we have that at least we can communicate with you of course have jellyfish in the real world but you're not going out there and talking to a jellyfish if you are you're gonna get stung so i like the idea of this i like the idea of trying to figure out how complex an alien race would be and then <clears throat> how complex they would be are they even fighting for the same resources so i don't know if you guys have seen this but a lot of people right now are talking about especially with space travel when you have multiple alien races that i are divergent even a small amount, they may look for completely different resources. And we're talking larger than, let's say, you know, I guess a koala bear eating a very specific style of plant and humans, for the most part, being omnivores and eating everything. But we're talking about entire resources may be required differently from some. And that's actually one of the big problems with the Fermi paradox and the idea of the Fermi paradox, which is like, oh, okay, this is how many alien races there might be. That is true in, in many ways. But when you look at it, we don't know what their resources would be and where they would even be and if we're looking in the right places. And of course, now we're getting to the point to where you're looking at AI and virtual worlds. It's like, would uh, alien race seek inwards instead of outwards? Would they go, listen, we can make whatever world you want appear to be real why do you need to go to space travel? Let's just use robots for that. Or yet let's use uh, different, you know, vehicles of some kind that we can just send shooting out. We'll get that data back and we can all talk about it and stuff. But, you know, organic is just too difficult for us to travel. It's uh, too dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on when it comes to space travel. And it's a good question when you think about it, when you look at alien races, how diverse you want them, interact with them. I like how he says make enemies with and also build bases and invade other alien races. So it's like, hey, man, let's all get together, find an alien race that we agree with so we can disagree with another alien race, join together and kick their ass. 
Citizen Sleeve says a good space game gives you a sense of wonder in the world and a freedom to design to explore in plethora of ways of engaging mechanically. That's obviously, you know, he's made games, but I do like that he caveated that very quickly enough freedom in design to explore. And that really is what I've been talking about this entire time, which is how contained are you going to be in your exploration and in your ability for a person to extend the resources that they have to make adjustments in the world, the puzzle solving, as we've heard people talk about, the ways you want to interact with those diverse races and kill them all, apparently, as Amud said. But no, you do have that issue with enough freedom and design. And that freedom and design needs to reflect the game in and of itself, because if it doesn't, you can have entire sections of your game that are quite diverse and quite detailed and no one knows they're there. And that actually does happen where you'll get a game. So for example, let's say you're placing a game like, let's say you're playing a game like um, FIFA. You're playing a game like FIFA and little did you know that FIFA also has a full on dating slash girlfriend slash career part of the sim that goes fully into that character's love life, family life, uh, where they're living, you know, how they're dealing with their day to day on the side that has nothing to do with FIFA. You'd be like, whoa, I didn't even know this existed because that would be instead of sort of a growth of all the mechanics in a bubble outwards from the center to really a very almost laser like laser like shot out of the side of the bubble that you originally have. So you create this bubble of control, this bubble of mechanics. And uh, you could even go so far as to say something like, you you know, whether it be an NFL game, whether it be, you know, a racing game, F1, something like that. There's a certain thing you expect. And when that bubble grows, you're like, okay, the bubble's grown in our technological ability. Our bubble's grown in our ability to control things. So we're going to have it so that you can also adjust your fuel air mixture. We're going to have it so you can adjust this and adjust that. Those things sort of all make sense because you might look at the engineer. You might look at the, uh, the engine maker. You might look at the race car driver. You might look at the team captain. And each one gets one or two extra things as each generation goes on. One or two extra steps. One or two extra little bits that they can impact. Oh, man, now we can make logos for our car that fits because we're also over here able to slightly adjust this one thing whether you know the look of the car in a certain way or something like that and so everything makes sense but you occasionally would get a game that has a really in-depth single particular section and it's almost like the developers looked at that and got excited all by themselves and were like hey dude we want to do that I think with space games saying enough freedom and design to explore in a plethora of wage of engaging mechanically with its world is pretty right Because if you have that freedom to design and you put that thought process down so that you're like, okay, we want a couple ways to mechanically engage with the game, but they need to all fit within everything else that we've put down. You can get some pretty cool games that don't all have to deal with this massive sense of scale. And it's funny because he didn't say sense of scale. He says a good space game gives you a sense of wonder in its world. So these last two or three answers have actually sort of reverted back to a completely different thought process, especially containing it down to in its world. He I don't think he meant Earth. It could be, but it sounds to me like he just really means in the world it's delivering. And that really is the big deal, right? Because all of these do different things, whether it be different scale, whether it be the way they handle the cutscenes, the way they handle their travel, the age of the characters. I mean, just look at some of these games. You have characters traveling for years in light speed and, you know, they're no older and there's no issues with time paradox and stuff like that, which is, by the way, fine. There doesn't need to be. But the idea is if you don't interact with those things, then in some other places in the game where something could be really crunchy science wise, you have to look at it and say, you know what? We probably can't do that because if we do that here, somebody's going to ask us, you know, why is nobody older? Abzi says, the most important thing for me in a space game is the interaction with objects, the environment, and or people living in planets. So in a spaceship sim, I'd like full control of all aspects of the ship from shields to power and weapons and custom mobility. In a space RPG, I like there to be a lot of interaction with NPCs, solving their problems or making them worse and the choices you make. In a boots on the ground or maybe sci-fi horror, like interactions with objects in the environment. Um, I still enjoy fast-paced, arcade style uh, space games like Everspace. They are fun. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that is, I think what we've come down to is it all depends on exactly what you're looking at when it comes to space and what makes a good one can be missed. For example, Everspace is a good example of a game where, so I liked Everspace 1 and Everspace 2 just hasn't grabbed me. And I think it's because of the roguelike elements that existed in the original. And I know that 2 is a different game. It's got its own things though, but there's there's all these different things with Everspace where I'm like, ah, you know, it probably won't be for me. 
And yet at the same time, I might completely have no issue playing freelancer. And I've always wondered about that. And I think overall, when I look at it, it's that ability to land and have some kind of, I don't even know what you would call it, that ability to have a fake transaction between two people, because that's really what it is in freelancer. You just sort of land and you walk up to a guy and he's like, yo, man, what's up? And you're like, nothing. You walk to the bar and you're like, hey, man, you heard any rumors? And the bar doesn't even tell you, by the way. He does. Obviously, they don't they didn't have that tech back then. There was there's no AI voice. It's just like, yeah, man, here's the news. And, you know, those those ideas that the news pops up and you take your job and you go out. And I love that, man. It, it just works for me. And then the idea of a horror game in space I mean, that one's almost even the opposite in the fact that it. I think it would be very hard to do a horror game in space where you controlled the spaceship for long periods of time. It, it, I mean, it could work, but it would be quite difficult. Instead, usually what horror games do is restrict your ability uh, as much as possible. Mirabilis says, regarding space games, as a fan of the old PNP game Traveler, I'm pretty excited for Starfield. We know it's not going to be out and out hard sci-fi, but the fact that it features gravity and some zero-G is pretty exciting. I guess the only thing... I'd like more as if the ships were a bit more akin to the expanse and design. Although I get why the typical here is the front. Uh, although I get why the typical here is the front. Here's the back school of design dominates. Also fewer lasers and more rail guns, particle accelerators. And like, also I would love to see someone tackle time delay as a factor. All too often we have the magic of instant communication and futuristic games. And albeit you obviously don't want communication to be restricted to the speed of light. When you are light years apart, I think there's an opportunity. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, I actually, even though I like the Expanse, man, I think their ships are just dump looking. But what's interesting is I'm rewatching that right now, and they have a lot of ships that you can see the front and you can see the back. So I don't know what that means. I think maybe you just mean a little bit clunkier. I mean, Battlestar Galactica, if you really look at it and they remove the words on the side and a couple other things, you could definitely think that thing was going backwards or forwards, backwards, or sideways. You could definitely look at that and go, what the fuck? Especially when you look at the Cylon ships, which technically are built in a particular way to give you the exact feel you just said, which is, you know, there is no front, there is no back. Uh, the Cylon ships are like that, really, from the big capital-style ships all the way down to the Cylon Raiders. Um, when you look at the way they're set up, if you flip that around, it may look a little weird with the trailing spikes that are the front end of that, but it wouldn't look too weird. You could certainly grasp it and be like, okay, you know, this is a thing. Now, when it comes to time dilation, that's interesting because I think the entire game would have to be about that. And I could be wrong because I'm sitting here talking to myself, but the idea of time dilation in a game and really caring about it and having it be an entire thing I think that that would have to be the main major aspect of the game, because if it wasn't, it would become humans don't work that way. Humans have a great deal of difficulty even figuring out that they're older. How many guys have you seen in their letterman jacket at a bar 25 years after their fucking last homecoming? Right. We don't even want to pretend we age, let alone tracking different planets and how the people on those planets age and the communication you could certainly have a war game where that happens, where years pass and you're handling resources. But again, I think that would be your entire game. You, humans just, man, their brains, that's a lot, right? That's a lot. Now we talk about pen and paper and traveler. Yeah, it's going to be interesting with Star Citizen because Star, or sorry, with Starfield, because we know that Starfield's got a couple parts, but they're removing others. So for example, they've stated, you know what? Gas doesn't seem to be a thing. We're going to have gravity, but gravity is a thing. Uh, so featuring gravity to me isn't that surprising because gravity is like it, it's in everything. Even if anti-gravity, you can still tell because it's anti-gravity. So I'm not quite sure what you mean by features gravity, but zero G, that could be great, right? The battles in zero G, that could be really fun to see for sure. Yeah. If you mean gravity on a spaceship, I get you. I think most games show gravity on spaceships just because it's easier. But uh, pen and paper and traveler. Yeah, I just I, I certainly look at Starfield and think of it as nothing. I know that, you know, he himself said he loved Traveler and I love that he said that. But I tried to remove that instantly from my brain because you have to remember he's an, a much older man who said he loved Traveler. And I think that age is a lot different. And you can look at an old game like Traveler and be like, holy shit, there's too much. And I have a feeling that's why. For a lot of this stuff, they've removed most of it. It's just going to have a slight feeling, which really technically, other than zero G, really technically isn't much different than, you know, No Man's Sky or some of the other games. Uh, it is, and you can certainly do some mods to change No Man's Sky to look more realistic graphically if you want that, uh, remove a lot of the 
uh, pomp and circumstance. But yeah, it's interesting to see somebody wanting the light years apart. I, I'm just trying to think. I just, I think overall, man, it's hard to do. It's hard to do the idea that humans, we can't even, humans are so fucking broken that we can't even do like suspended animation, right? Humans don't even work in suspended animation. And matter of fact, most scientists have looked at it and identified that other than hibernation that we see in some species, which by the way, many species that we think hibernate, they for sure know, do not fully hibernate. They get up, they eat, they can be woken up. It's not what people think. And humans and their anxiousness and all that kind of shit, oh my God. I mean, the idea, for example, let's say a human goes to sleep and they're suspended animation for 20 years. Let's just say 20 years. Nothing wrong with that. Suspended animation. Uh, first of all, you have body waste. That would be incredible. 20 years would be incredible. It would be, um, you know, very much a situation where you would never get that muscle mass back again, ever. And they've covered this before with people who have, like, uh, gained the ability to walk because of, uh, you know, an illness, lesions, and, you know, new technology and the ability to walk, you know, it's just, it's, I mean, the brain, the body's bones and stuff aren't prepared for that. So you have that cancer. Think about this. Some cancers take forever to grow. And then once they get to a certain point, they explode. Can you imagine going to sleep with 20 other people on your starship? You wake up 20 years later. Six of them look like tumoristic, nasty ass, fatty blobs of diseased gel. Because at some point, you know, some kind of metastasis has grown on their skin somewhere, and that skin cancer has eaten everything. Now, admittedly, I'm not saying any game is going to simulate that. I'm talking about that's what happens in real life, and so the idea of trying to simulate it uh, is w one where if you go too deep, it's going to get really creepy. Be, it'll be fun to see what they try to do. John Jock says, simply the transition of flying between the atmosphere and space and worlds needs to be epic graphically. Yeah, very cool when you can fly in and out of space, right? And you get that feeling of like really traveling. It, 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 definitely any game that skips that, it's a little bothersome when you come out of the atmosphere and it's like, you know, loading. You're just like, uh, seriously, man, come on, give, come on, give it to me. I, I mean, we're, we're here for that translation. And when you see that switch, it feels so good. When you see that full real life switch, of course, if you're first person and stuff and you expect it. Yeah, you, I, I totally get you. Empire Galorpus says, I think a good space game conveys breadth and otherworldliness. Uh, in order to sell you on the vastness, make you truly believe the setting to be foreign, make you feel small and unequipped, even if you're in a position of power. I think many games do this properly. Halo does this. Hmm. Looking at the Halo ring for the first... Uh, interesting. Halo does this. Same with Dyson Sphere program. Flying as a single mech through a fully moduled, uh, modeled nebula makes you feel like absolutely nothing. Interesting. Halo does this. Huh. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess Halo's got... So the best part about Halo, of course, I think what you mean is that sense of atmosphere and scale. When you guys come out of the ship in Halo, or even when you land on it, you can see it's, it's a ring, and then you start to look out into the distance and you see the ring bending around you. So yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. I, I, I guess it's just not the... It's not a game I thought anybody would suggest, but I'm somewhat gathering what you're saying. Makes you truly believe in a setting to be foreign to Earth. Well, I have a question. Does a space game have to be foreign to Earth? Because I don't necessarily think it does. But, I mean, unless we're saying you can't include the moon, because I was I was saying you'd have a really cool game where the entire space game was built around getting enough people to the moon to, let's say, escape an asteroid that was going to hit or something weird like that. Even though technically, if you went to the moon and a massive asteroid hit, the chance of that asteroid throwing shit into the atmosphere and back towards the moon, pretty fucking high. On Twitter, the answer to this, let's see, abbreviated review says, space games have the distinction of being one of the last great journeys into the unknown. This makes them one of the best uh, genres of media to tell stories that allow for odysseys with unique discovery, whether it's mishappened worlds, inhuman characters, or absurd anomalies. Yeah, you definitely have to look at that and think, you know, other than possibly the deep ocean, where there certainly is that ability for you to feel like you're seeing the unknown spaces is, is for sure the way Manny says I think it's a discovery and exploration finding the new people are inherently curious that desire to explore the unknown and understand the unreachable such a huge facet yeah, it's interesting that that's what we all gravitated to when a lot of space games have no real exploration or discovery in them but 
I agree. And the way I wrote it, you know, like what is a space game? I didn't say one just based in space. So it is funny that for the most part, we all sort of agreed uh, initially on what our thought process was going to be, what our thought process was going to be when it comes to space. I think space is highly advantageous as sort of the next place in which a lot of these games are going to go. And I think there's one particular game, there's one particular game genre that hasn't gone there. And it most likely is because it's been usurped and may not ever be able to go there fully the way we want, which would be No Man's Sky. I think No Man's Sky has made it so that a space MMO is going to be quite difficult. I mean, you could say, okay, here's a space MMO like No Man's Sky, but it's multiple thousands of people on the same planet if you want to go there. That's great and everything, but No Man's Sky has got its own issues. For example, let me just point out a couple issues that maybe you have forgotten about No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky doesn't do cities. No Man's Sky doesn't do towns. No Man's Sky has a hard enough time doing six fucking people in the same place. And yes, you do have the one particular place you can get when the expansion came out where you could all go and land and it was more a, a ton of people. It's one very specific place, but they do cities terribly. And even trying to build your own can be quite difficult. So that's a place where I could see an MMO really nailing it. I mean, imagine playing a game that's somewhat like No Man's Sky, but you go to a planet and the planet's got a couple places, but it also da -da, finally has, a, you know, a, a place with a couple thousand people in it. So it feels like a full city. And that's one place where I think a lot of these games miss out. You know, when you look at games and they're like, oh, man, it's the it's the dangerous outer worlds. It's this, it's that. The reason why this, you know, civilization on this planet is so small is because it's so dangerous. And it's like, I get that. But at times they would also join together. And we saw that with, you know, colonization of America. We we saw that with we've seen it everywhere where people at some point will band together or will group back up together and be like, OK, let's work together at this thing. Or, you know, let's give up on this one planet because it's covered in fucking lava and let's go to another planet where we can actually live. You know, sometimes they do die. But I mean, at some point you have to look at it and be like, come on, man. Come on, let's put a couple thousand on one planet so we can see what it looks like. And that's one thing that most space games can't hit. I mean, Elite really stumbled. Elite has really taken a ton of hits actually recently, which it that game, it came out. And I remember people laughing at it because they they heard all about Star Citizen, including myself. And we were Star Citizen. You can do all this shit and blah, blah, blah. And this was years and years ago. And then suddenly Elite's like, yeah, we can fly in space. And that's it. People are just like, ha, ha, ha. You can only fly in space. And then, of course... Time-wise, it's the only one getting released. And it gets released, and it handled space great. And then it's like, well, here's some planets. And, you know, I, I personally think that they're handled pretty poorly, but whatever, they're there. And then, you know, we get the on-foot stuff, which has been really a tremendous disaster. And I, I, admittedly, the last time I checked on this was about two months ago. So maybe in the last two months, they've made some utter unbelievable change. But overall, that game has stumbled continually here trying to do anything other than its core, other than really delight its core demographic of flying from place to place to place to place. And I've even noticed that really the talk about it has gone down. So you still hear stories about like, here's the gas station guys, they'll come and fly and save you, you know, and you get the occasional PC gamer story. But we're getting still more stories about EVE Online. And I think with EVE, you know, you have this step towards the idea of what a lot of us want, but it's still quite difficult. Man, that is a cumbersome ass game. Like there's a lot going on in that game that I think most of us just don't want to parse and would love to be able to parse. A lot of people, I think, see somebody say, man, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to jump into this and think it's a sheer laziness. Most of the time it's not. Most of the time it is actually just worry that they won't do well or that the time will be wasted. Um, Back to... Disc, back to Patreon, and then we'll end this up. Dylan says, I'm intrigued by mysteries in space, especially when it invokes an unsettling fear, feeling or danger. I also like when space games handle the size and scale of ships and planets to inspire awe. I imagine a giant ship warp driving into the player's field of view and feeling so small in comparison. Yeah, it seems like a lot of us are mentioning scale and that feeling of scale really not being replicated by anything other than space. I mean, even looking at planets, look at Mars, I mean, Olympus Mons and how big that is compared to any of the mountains we have in the, I mean, on the planet. It's nuts when you think of the scale. Shogun says size and scope. Unit characters should be minuscule, minuscule compared to everything around you, such as giant capital ships and colony wars. 
Flying your tiny ship past a behemoth ship. Pretty cool back in the day. There should be some sort of bug-eyed easy a bug-eyed realization when you encounter what deep space can hold. I thought he was going with an alien, so I was thinking something else there. Uh, some sort of bug-eyed realization. Yeah, that I think what he means is awe. When you look at something, you're like, holy crap, this is big. But this has gone long enough. I wanted to do one of these to sort of bounce all the ideas off of people and talk about what my thoughts are about what their thoughts were. If you guys have any, I want to hear them in Discord or in Patreon. Post off and say what your thoughts are. If I mistake messed up what you were saying, feel free to correct me. I don't think I did, um, but I think I got everybody as well. But I would love for you guys to respond to this. If you're listening to it on Twitter or wherever, um, you know, share that you're there. Patron, share that you were on Patron. Uh, let's see what else we got. iTunes, Spotify. That's it for me. I hope you guys like this first episode of what makes a good blank. Space games in this instance. Peace out.